Exodus 34, verse 28 to 35, rather, sorry. I'm reading from the NIV. Moses was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights without eating bread or drinking water. And he wrote on the tablet the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant. Note, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them. So Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, that's to speak with the Lord, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter 3 from verses 1 to 18. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need... Are we there? Are we all there? Okay. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you, this Apostle Paul addressing the people of Corinth. He's talking to them and he's asking them this question. You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the spirits of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from the Lord, comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory, so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of his glory, fading though it was, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the Spirit that condemns men is glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was fading away came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold, we are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day, the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. I think King James or some other version says that the same veil remains when Moses is read. If you read any part of the New Testament and you hear Moses, he's talking about the covenant, the old covenant. Amen. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil covers their hearts. But when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is liberty. There is freedom. There is liberty. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. So please turn to someone sitting beside you, maybe to the left or to the right, and just rehearse these words after me. Say, remove the veil. Just say that. Remove the veil. Uh -huh. That is what we are going to talk about today. It's about removing the veil. The book of Corinthians, first and second in particular, um, have a lot of, um, let me say, implications for us, especially in the dispensation we find ourselves. You think about the background of the city of Corinth being a cosmopolitan area, just like the way maybe Sakomono, Spintex, these areas have become now. 
it would be very difficult it would be difficult for anybody to convince me that maybe his hometown is Sakumono or you know something like that. I, I see a lot of people who are rather migrated or moved from other places and they are doing business here, isn't it? <laughs> so based on that, anytime we do a study on the book of Corinthians, I I see ourselves in there as a PIW Sakumono. Amen. All right, so we'll be doing something briefly. I'll try and compare the old and new covenants like you saw the Apostle Paul trying to do. So we'll pick our text from the Second Corinthians scripture we just read. Then we would focus on some veils. We are talking about removing the veil, and so we'd have to describe what that veil is. Then again, we look at, so at the end of the day, what are we supposed to do? What should we do as Christians? who want to be transformed into the image and the likeness of Christ. Then we conclude. Hallelujah. So first of all, let's just let's start comparing right away. He says the old covenant was written on a tablet of stone. You remember earlier, Moses went to be with the Lord. He took some tablets. He came back. When he came, the people were doing some stuff with their lives. He dropped the tablets and they got broken. Do you remember? Uh-huh. He had to go back for the same tablets. I mean, on the face of it, uh, now you know we have electronic tablets and all of that. I'm just imagining how durable that would have been for people to write on tablets and preserve them over a long period of time. You see, huh. in this our uh, dispensation, God is not pointing us to the tablets of stone again, but he said that he has written his covenant on our hearts. Why? So that as for our hearts, it remains with us. So it will never leave us. Amen. Uh-huh. So it's not about a stone being with somebody, a priest, who will get angry and drop it and it will be broken. And we can't find it in, again. But this time around, he has written the covenant on our hearts. How is it in our hearts? We have the whole Christ himself, the whole Holy Spirit living inside of us. Amen. And so we have God himself in our hearts. He says that this old covenant is a letter of the law. The new one is of the Spirit. So it is not about the law anymore. The law which the people struggled so hard to obey. Which, if we were to resurrect 613 of them, I would have failed right now. Just by my dressing, I have failed. Just by my haircut, I have failed. Are you appreciating the difficulty? So now, we are not doing that anymore, but we are focusing on the spirit. We will talk about that one later on. And this letter, it says, it kills. And indeed, of the people who set out from, Israel, uh, from Egypt, 600,000 or so of them, only two were able to make it. All of them, they died in the wilderness. The people who left Egypt. But this spirit, the Bible says that this spirit gives life. You see? So you should be excited about, you know, where we have come to. The old covenant came with that. I've talked about it already. And that one, it condemns straight away. You see, when you do this and this and this and this, stone the person. When this person does this and doesn't do this, kill the person. Take the person out of the camp. The person should be purified for seven days. Blah, blah, blah. Condemnation. So... But you see, this one, The Bible says that for now, there is no condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So please, let's allow the Spirit to move in righteousness, not in condemnation. Amen. That other one, the old one, it has some glory. Fading though it was, the Apostle Paul says, but it it still has some glory. But you see, when you have something that has some, and you have another one that has all oh, eh, the, the cast, you know, the full option, eh? full option. I mean, you, you have full option. And I want to say that I have some. Which one will you choose? Let's leave the sum and pick the full option. Amen. So the old one has some glory. So let's leave it and hold on to the one that has all the glory. The Bible says it is more glorious. 
And that one does not fade away. Amen. Amen. So why are we talking about some views this morning? So when you check the intention of Moses, now we are reading into Moses' mind, and based on the scripture we have read, you could tell that, you see, the Bible says he himself, I didn't even know his face was radiating like that. You heard me repeat that, right? So it wasn't like he knew, hey, my face is shining. Let me try and deceive the people by doing this, by showing them that it's no more shining or anything. He himself didn't even know. It was the people who saw the glory. So you see, the veil is not something bad or negative or anything we are going to talk about today, but there are the seemingly good stuff around us. You see, the essence is not to deceive, but it's only to conceal. That is why Apostle Paul says that to this day, when the old covenant is read, there is a veil on their hearts. It conceals certain things. It doesn't make, it, it doesn't make them see clearly enough. And there are people to this day who are still waiting for the Messiah. They haven't accepted the finished work of the cross. And it's because of these veils. The point is that the veils have a potential to cloud our minds and our spirits so that we are not able to get to the real thing. So we may still be holding on to that glory that is fading, that has some glory, and then we will leave the one that has the full option. Let's go to the very first one. I may rush through it because of time. So please follow me. Oh, I heard all. <laughs> so, the veil of putting sacrifice before obedience. You see, one feature, one common feature among the Israelites is that, you see, they were very, very good at sacrificing. I, I, I am yet to experience that kind of giving where the pastor has to say that, please, oh, it's okay, you have come too much, stop, keep, keep whatever you have, don't bring it again. Have you experienced it? Uh, or if you haven't experienced it, the Israelites did it. They did it. It was very easy for them to do it. But when it came to obeying, oh, don't do this, don't do that, that one, it was tough for them. But you realize that God's emphasis is not really on sacrifice. All the time, God wants us to obey first. So we don't put the cart before the horse. Hallelujah. Just simple obey. Moses has gone to meet with the Lord to go and communicate and bring you information. They couldn't wait. Exodus 32. They couldn't wait for it. By the time he came back home, they had managed to create another God for themselves. They said, that, oh, this was the God that brought us out of Egypt. How pathetic. It runs through one to the extent that King Saul, you remember King Saul? You have gone for a battle. You have received instructions from the prophets of God. Do this. Do this. Kill everyone. Destroy everything. He said, oh, in my mind, the prophet is wrong. I have to leave some to offer sacrifices to God. See, so he placed sacrifice over obedience. Then now, someone had to tell him that to obey is better than sacrifice. Check through all of scripture. Proverbs 21. Do we have it today? Verse 3. It says, to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. The NLT says that the Lord is more pleased when we do what is right and just than when we offer him sacrifices. Amen. And that is why the Bible recalls that God accepted Abel and his offering. He accepted Abel. It was the acceptance of what the person has done before even receiving the thing the person has done. Okay. So that should be our focus. Based on the strength of these things, I want to suggest to you that sacrifice is probably secondary when it comes to God's language. The first one should be obedience. Amen. So may we endeavor to obey. Jesus said in John 14, 15, that if you love me, obey my commandments or keep my commandments. Then God testifies about Abraham. That's as for Abraham, I know he will command his house. Genesis 18, verse 19. I know him. He will command his house to obey me. Hey, to obey me. May God grant us the humility of hearts to obey. 
Amen. Let me quickly jump to the next one. I've tried to combine two of them. One is one point, the other one is another point, but I've tried to merge them because of um, the time. So, seeming spirituality, and I've added religion to it. Like I said, see, these are very good stuff. A sacrifice is not good. A sacrifice is not good. It's very good. And in fact, today we will sacrifice. Amen. Amen. Oh, or you won't sacrifice. Uh -huh. As you are even here, you have sacrificed already. Uh -huh. So this one too, it's a very good thing. Spirituality. Is it not good? Are we not a spiritual church? We are. Very good. Religion. Religion is good. Isn't it good? It's good. Uh -huh. But you see, let's see something. Something happened in the lives of the Israelites. They went for a battle. Some people died. In fact, 4,000 people died in 1 Samuel 4. The people went to confess. They said that, ah, it's because the Ark of Covenant is not there. So let's go and bring the Ark. And they managed to bring the Ark into their camp. In fact, the Bible says that when the Ark came, hey, there was shout, hey, we have won victory. And the Philistines were confused. Hey, they were, in fact, they shook, they trembled, and they said that, hey, these people, they have brought this ark again. No, 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 no. The battle is gone already. But you know what happened? When they brought the ark and they went for that second battle, 30,000 more died. Would it have been logical that without God, without God, 4,000 have died. Now that God has come, we should win. Or at least, let's be zero. But with God, rather now, 30,000 people are dying. What does it suggest to us? In their mind, the symbol of God was the ark. And so once they had the ark, that was all. They were, just, they were not open to any other thing. They were not open at all. Samson also did the same mistake. At some point, when he had his hair shaved off and all of that, he said, oh, I'll do this one more time. The Bible says he did not know that the Lord had left him. He wasn't away. I'm going somewhere with this one. Why am I saying all these things? See, Jesus had a very nice conversation with Nicodemus in John chapter 3. And he explained to him what it is like to be born of the Spirit. And he likened the spiritual man to the wind. Do you feel some wind blowing around you right now? Can you catch it? You try, try and catch it, let me see. Oh, you won't even try eh? It's a wild good chase, right? That is how the one born of the Spirit is like, unpredictable. So it's not like you place a person in a box or you place a spirit in a box. And I've come to see, I have seen so many, many, many things when it comes to some of these things. Eh? God can use somebody eh? and you will sit down eh? You will think, ah, your thinking will not think again. Because of what you know about the person. See, I know, but it is God who is moving. It is not you who determines what happens. So that is what spirituality is supposed to be. We should be open-minded about it. We should allow ourselves and allow the move of God. Just like, whether you like it or not, the wind is blowing around you. That is how the spirit also moves. Amen. Okay. So it's not necessarily about the sounds and the gimmicks. When you check Ezekiel 37, where the dry bone story, see, the prophet observed there was some mighty move. Bones came together. I mean, there was noise. There was all of, maybe today we'd have called it revival. See? Uh, then bones are joining. I mean, this one is not wonderful. Spectacular, isn't it? Me, I've never seen the sight before. If I saw something like that, I would have um, exclaimed, this is revival. But the Bible says that there was no breath in them when the bones came together. So God had to now orchestrate another move to get breath in, inside of them. So the shouting can happen. The screaming can happen. But it is not necessarily indicative of the presence of God. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ prescribes that true spirituality he says, this is how we should serve God. He said we should do it in spirit and in truth. Finished. This is what Jesus Christ told the woman at the well. John 4. He expressed us to worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, 
This, where is my wife? I've gotten there. Should I say it? <laughs> uh, it is possible. It is possible. I am saying it is possible to, to go by the tenets of, let's say, Catholicism or Methodism or Charismatism. Are you getting me? Or even Pentecostalism and still miss it. You can be in those lanes and stay there and still miss it. Why? Because that's not a prescription. The prescription is in spirit and in truth. Did I say anything bad? Uh -huh. That is all it is. And I thought I was thinking too wild until I saw this scripture in Isaiah 58. Where Isaiah was telling people, in fact, God was speaking to them that you, you fast. And interestingly, they were fasting for the, the wrong reasons. They were fasting and misbehaving in the fasting. When you get to them, please read Isaiah 58. You'll be amazed that people can fast and still do this, like in the course of their fasting. May God give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we know him better. Amen. Amen. What is religion? It's, typical, it's typical, um, basically a catalog of do's and don'ts. You see, do this, you don't do this. Yeah, you sit here, don't sit there. Do this one, don't do this. That is why I thank God for where the Spirit has brought this our church. Amen. Amen. See, once upon a time, once upon a time, you couldn't have sat like this. You should have been here. You two, you should have been here. I haven't mentioned anybody's name. But you should have been here. You two, you should have been here. You see, we're well, not mix, mix. But the Spirit is moving in a church. And so we are not restraining ourselves to do's and don'ts. Don't do this. Do this one. Do this one. You do this one. The spirit will not move. No. We are allowing the spirit to move in the church. Amen. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. So please, let's fall in line. Let me just do the last one. Then we go. Jesus Christ told the Pharisees that you, you love to sit in the high places. You want to receive greetings. I think you can read the Amplified then. Luke eleven forty three. Says, what to you Pharisees? You love to you love the best seats in the synagogues, and you love to be greeted and bowed down to in the public marketplaces. See, this is the problem. It's not about where you sit. It's not about even receiving the greeting. It's not about that, but it's about the loving of the being bowed down to. That is where the titles comes in. Hey. So, his. Now, you, you, I am this. Introduce yourself. You mention his name. You go and start from. I am His Excellency, Dr. Prophet, Dr. Prophet. That's, what you, that's where you will start from. Me, that is not your name. What is your name? Kofi Mensa. Or didn't know who Professor, Dr. Prophet. Before he gets to the name, two minutes. And we love that one. You see, when you are not careful, that one may cloud your judgment and your understanding about what the Spirit is supposed to do. Amen. Amen. Ha. This is what the Pharisees were doing. Christ says that our righteousness should exceed that of the Pharisees, so we should be able to look beyond this one. Amen. Amen. So please, when you meet me, and the first one that comes to you is Nehemiah, just say it. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. This is my problem with some people. Let it flow naturally. Eh, Ima? I relate to you as Ima, isn't it? Have I ever, so, hey, 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 Professor Doctor, have I ever done that to you? Uh -huh. That is how it should be. Amen. Because if I am not careful, the title of whatever may make me love to receive the greeting of that place. And I may not experience the spirit. So I've said that we should be careful to check affluence, closely related. See, when you do so well, eh, the Ashantis have a proverb. They say that at ye madeng, I refer. See, if you are not careful, we will be doing so well. In fact, I want to do well. Do you want to do well too? Oh, yes, it's not bad. Wanna, eh, it's, not, it's not bad. If today, I mean, last, was it last week? When was it? That someone was saying that oh, someone could just rise up and say that, oh, I'm, I'm paying for it. I mean, it would have been nice, isn't it? So I want to do well. I really want to do well. I want a lot of cash. It's important. But you see, that one should not cloud 
my relationship with the Holy Spirit and me allowing the Spirit to move. Amen. There is that temptation. Temptation. See, I'm busy. See, I flew in from Texas last night. See, this morning I have another appointment. See, those things, they have the tendency of putting a veil over our hearts. Hey, if you're not careful, if you're not careful. And that one happened to the Pharisees. They were busily doing these things, and they had forgotten to place emphasis on the most important part of Christ's teachings. Hallelujah. Apostle Paul said that all these things, eh, in fact, he enumerated a lot of achievements and titles and all of that in Philippians 3. He spoke of me, I'm a Jew. Who want to talk about a Pharisee? Me, I'm a Pharisee. I have studied the law. I have done this. I know this. I know this. I know this. When he finished, then he said that I count all of those things as dung. I won't explain what dung is. All of them, they are zero. They are non-score. I don't recognize them. Why? Because I have to press on towards the mark of the higher calling. I want to know him more. I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection. That's the most important one. Amen. So what should we do? What should we do? The Bible says that we should turn to the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 16. It says, turn to the Lord. It says, nonetheless, when one turns to the Lord, this veil is removed. So it's removed. I couldn't tell whether it is the Lord who will remove it or the person who will remove it. But I am very certain that we have a part to play in removing the veil. Amen. That is why I made you tell somebody, remove the veil. Do you get me now? Nice one. So whether it is by the Lord or it is by us, there should be a removal. Something should leave us. Something should uncover us so that we will be open with the Lord. In fact, there's no point in playing games with God. This is God. He is God. What games again? He knows everything. He's all-knowing. What is turning to the Lord? True repentance. Maybe some of these things, when we hear them in church, we are tempted to think that it's meant for other people. But by virtue of today's word, just give yourself a chance and rethink your position again. Hallelujah. Just take your time and assess yourself again and be sure that you have really turned to the Lord. And don't just turn to the Lord, but remain in him. Because you can turn, and after two minutes, you turn again, isn't it? But the key is in turning and remaining in that direction, which is very, very important. Concentrate on God. You see, when you come to church, eh, a lot of things can offend you. Even what I'm doing right now, it can offend you. Do you know that? I, I have been involved in church work for a very long time, and some of the things that offend people eh, are amazing. Are amazing. For one, for one, the same thing. I have not done it for me. You didn't do it for me. The other person too will say that you have done it too much. You have done it too much. The same thing. Oh. So which is which? Huh. So if our concentration shifts from God to now these things, it will be difficult. Amen. Amen. So please, let us concentrate on God. Bitterness, memory, those things, they are bound to happen, you know, once a while. Hey. Because we are an organization of people, different backgrounds, diverse, different levels of understanding, and even different preferences. Hey, different preferences. What I like, you don't like. What you like, I may not like. So it's very important that we handle offenses very, very well, especially in a church like ours. Hey, if you don't do that, your attention will shift from God. May God help us. Amen. Find something to occupy yourself. When you find yourself in church like this, eh, do something. I've always said, when was the last time you saw me standing here preaching? Do you remember? Do you remember? So if I was to wait for how many years to be given a microphone and a pulpit before I minister to somebody, how long would I have to wait? It means I will do the work of ministry once every how many months. <laughs> That's how it is going to be. But I tell you what, 
there is a lot of avenue for you to work. In this church, there's a lot of work. I tell you that if you, if you want, I told someone something that if you like, decide that every Sunday you get to know one new person in this church, one new person you have never spoken to. It is possible. Even the whole year, you go through the whole year and you would, have, you, would have, you would not have finished it. Even that one alone. There's a lot of work. So please find something to do. So when you are busy, eh, the offense may come, but you may not notice it so easily. Do you agree with me? Yes. Then once again, the next thing. Look into the mirror of the word. The verse 18 talks about, it says, we are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. I want to read the King James. The King James says something. Where is the King? I put it somewhere. It says, we all behold with open face, beholding. Beholding means that we are looking, we are watching. As in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed. So you behold means that you deliberately look, you deliberately watch. Amen. I live in the house with one of you, so I know what I'm talking about. The minimum number of mirrors you have, minimum, should be maybe two or three. And a minimum, I'm not talking about minimum. You have more, isn't it? The same mirror. The same mirror. It's, it's called mirror. Hey, I just say mirror. Mirror. So please, it's mirror. The same typo. You have the long one, you have the one in your bag, you have the one here, you have the one, isn't it? Huh. In the same way we should treat the word of God. See, King James, ESV, NLT, ISV, Amplified, all of them, they are written for us. So it's because of us. To give us more meaning, more understanding. If I start with the thou, 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 I say two statements, thou, thou, you'll be confused. But if you read other ones, it may bring you some more whole meaning, isn't it? And there are certain things who, like we just read from the King James. Behold, it gives you a clear meaning. Behold means that behold. Watch. And, uh, uh -huh. So we need all of them. So please get as many mirrors as possible. Amen. Amen. I'm not talking about the other mirror. I'm talking about the mirror of the word of God. Amen. Amen. Uh -huh. We are being transformed. Consistency. It's a daily work. It's for no reason that God will reveal himself to Moses as I am. I am. Present tense. It's not I was. It's I am. So it means that every day we renew this our move to intensely gaze into this mirror of the word. I want to conclude by saying that whether it, it is the glory of Moses or Christ or the spirit or whoever, it is not ours. You check Moses. He was reflecting the glory of the Lord. Check Christ in this at this presentation too. We don't reflect our own glory. We reflect the glory of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So it's, not, it's none of us. After we have done all these things and we are radiating and our faces are beaming and the glory is there, things are working, things are moving well and all of that, let's be careful not to ascribe this glory to ourselves. So you don't get offended when there's a list of vote of thanks. My first thanks goes to, my second thanks goes to, then you'll be looking forward to your name being mentioned. Yeah. They didn't mention my name. Hey! Wait, see. You see, wait, see. What are thanks we must see? <laughs> we don't clamor for rewards. And if you are in COP, you understand this one better. You see, in this church, eh? <laughs> we will reward you. Oh, I'm telling you, we will reward you. The rewarder, is God himself. Oh, yes. If you are expecting me to come and shake your hand, you have done what I may not even see it. I may not even notice it. I, I may never, I may never even say good morning to you. It is possible. Is there someone I've never greeted in this church? Uh -huh, there are ten of them. You see, it's possible. But it, if God greets you, eh, one greeting from God, blessed are you amongst women. You see, you see, those kind of greetings, you are highly favored. When God himself greets you like that, I mean, what more? What more are you looking for? So let's not be confused at all, whether we are recognized or we are not. Amen. Amen. When we do these things, then now we are better placed to be able to possess our nations. And then the maximum impact, which I left out of my title, 
we are able to make it and make it. And then we will have maximum impact on our immediate surroundings and everybody who is looking at us. And then God will also give us the ultimate one. Well done, good and faithful servants. May God bless you. Amen.